Okay, lecture 12. And let's start. I don't have any announcements. So first thing we are doing is minute quiz. Tail, we don't take it. Right, this time I try not to flip it up again. So it's head. We're taking the minute quest. I don't think so, at least. <laughs> Just take a regular piece of paper if you have one. Sorry. I haven't taken a minute quiz for so long, I haven't made new papers. You don't need a calculator for that, no. If <laughs> twenty more seconds. All right, that's it. It doesn't need to, you don't if you wrote ten bits that's fine. If it's eleven bits, it's fine. All right. Yes. <laughs> pretty much. If you have something below ten bits, then it's not right. Why is that? Why do you need ten bits or more? What's two to the ten? It should be a number everybody should know. Right. Sorry? Exactly. Right? So if you have 10 volts divided by 1024, you get below 10 millivolts. It's nine point something. 
Ryan, I don't think you need a calculator for that one. Good. All right. It would have been easier, yes. But this is the kind of math that you as an engineer really should just be able to whip out, right? OK. Quick recap. Um, I think I need to explain a little bit more on dithering. Um, more specifically, um, how do you actually inject random noise into the systems? And there are two examples here on how to do it. The easier one is if you have a random analog noise generator, and then you just add it to the signal that you're trying to measure and feed that into the ADC. And then in software back here, you average over the samples that you're taking. Another option that's probably a little bit more accurate, I'm not entirely sure what the big difference is, but what you do is you have a digital pseudo-random noise generator. You use an, a digital to analog converter to take that signal and make it into an analog signal, feed it into your signal, and then at the same time, you subtract it again on the sampled system itself. Right? That way you can dither your system and you can actually increase your um, accuracies in the ADC readings. Yes? So is so the random analog noise is like thermal noise enough? No. What you have to have is at least like the peak to peak of the noise has to be a third to about one well, least significant bit. Well what I mean is say you have an op amp that's scaling your input for your ADC and you use a two opt-out package, and you take the other one, give it infinite gain, or not infinite gain, but really high gain, and feed that into it as well. Now you need four to make it suffer. Never mind. Well, but you could use four. You could, yeah. OK. So but the key here is that you feed the random noise that you're generating has to be zero mean. right? Because what you want to do is that if you average over this, the random noise disappears. But since you now get the average of the signal, which will be the signal you're actually trying to measure, that way you can actually increase your um, digital um, numbers or your accuracies in the ADC without having to increase the number of bits in your ADC itself. Okay, today let's continue on with um, the last lecture. So first we will finish up DAX and then we talk about ADC architectures. So how would you build a DAC? A DAC is a digital to analog converter, right? So what you want to do is you want to give it an, a digital signal and something analog should come out. And one of the easiest architectures you could think of is if you have a resistive divider, right? We know that these nodes in here are equally spaced now. So all that we really have to do is take a selector that selects one of these lines and feeds it out. At the end, we do have a unit gain buffer in order to not disrupt our um, resistive divider here. That's one of the simplest digital to analog converters that you can think of. What could be the problem with one of these systems? You always draw in current. Yes, but you can minimize that by changing the values on these, right? Like if you take big enough resistors, then the current through this will be almost minimal, like negligible compared to other stuff. But it certainly is a concern. Yes? Accuracy, why? Yes, resistor values will change with temperature. However, if you think about it, if the reference is constant, all these re resistors should more or less change in the same way, right? So that way, the voltages should actually stay more or less where they were. Yes, loading, right? If you wouldn't have this unit gain buffer over here, if you start loading this line, your resist, resistive, resistive divider here would not be accurate anymore. So that's why you have a unit gain output at the end. Yes? Is that susceptible to noise? Susceptible to noise. Absolutely, yeah. If you have noise up on here, um, that will propagate through on the unit gain buffer and it will come out again. Absolutely. So you need to have a stable reference. What about size? Yeah, resistors are gigantic. Yeah. Resistors, like these resistors, you need two to the n different resistors, right? So on a 10-bit DAC, you need 1,024 resistors in order to do this, right? And it's also an extremely long chain that you have to build. So that's when you can go over into this one here, where it's a folded architecture, which is actually exactly the same thing. Now it works similar to how a memory architecture works. 
you have word lines and you have the columns that actually get the data out and then only one of these, um, let me think, Okay, yeah, it's just one of these lines is actually getting selected and then you get one of these transistors that gets activated, it will tap out the capacitor through here and then feed it out at the bottom over here. Does that make sense? Transistors. This doesn't make sense, right? You have one of these lines will select the line, one of these ones will select a column. And then, yes, you have to have one of these lines will select one of the, the four columns, so the word lines. One of these here will select one of the data lines over here. And what happens is that the word line, for example, gets selected here, and then you have the data line that gets selected down here. So only this path, for example, will go through the unique game buffer and out. Make sense? Advantage of this is area-wise it's smaller. You don't have this like long, long resistive divider chain. It's basically just folded into each other um, the way that you now get a square form. These are very simple ones. You can have different architectures. For example, you can have a system like this where you have different resistors. So you have a 2R, 4R, 8R, and 16R. And then you select the different ones of them. I have a, unique gain, a, a buffer back here, which is not unique gain anymore. It can actually amplify now the signal. And that way, you also can generate a DAC. What can be the problem of one of these, though? Like, if you think about this over here, if you make sure that these lines get selected, one of the lines gets selected at one point only, and not that there's a flip in between them, this one here will actually be uniform, right? If you go from line to line to line to line to line, the value will always be increasing. What happens on this architecture if you switch around the bits? It does change the resistance, yes. And it could happen that if you actually flip it over, that sometimes in the flipping, the, re the output will drop down before it goes higher up, or it goes first higher up and then drops down a little bit, right? Because now all of a sudden you have multiple switches that have to switch exactly at the same time and if they're slightly out of sync, what can happen is that this one here will bounce up or down. So it's not a monotone line anymore and you can have glitches. And similar architecture down here where instead of the, having the resistors, you can actually have constant current sources. Same effect happens because of the, the buffer and the gain down here you will get an output regarding to, with respect to how much current you're actually switching into um, the system itself. Questions on these two architectures? <coughs> no? Not yet? Yes? So when the switch, when the bit is tied, is it grounded? Is that what you're doing right now? Yes. OK. Yeah. It's a lot smaller. Yes. Okay. One of the problems with DAX is also that you have to filter the output that comes out of them. So, for example, here we have a data sheet of a Maxim um, 191700 DAC, and what it tells you is that its frequency response on the output is something like this. So you have higher order noise in your output signal. That comes from the digital nature of your DAC, because when you switch, you get very high frequency noise in your line, right? Something that happens is that if you switch from one tick to the next one, it will be like this, and then it will switch over to the next one. These edges here will introduce noise, and it's not the nice signal that you want that would, for example, go smooth up from one frequency to the next one. So what you want to do is you want to first add a low pass filter, which will actually smooth these corners here. And in addition to that, you want to add a unit gain to the output of a DAC, because DACs are usually not loadable. So you can't put a load onto a DAC output, because it just cannot deal with much current. So what you do is you add a unit gain buffer, 
in this configuration at the end and the output of your DAX, and that way you can now start driving whatever you want using this game buffer. That way you won't go and impact the output of the DAC itself and increase its uh, make it less accurate. Questions on DAX? Yes. It might. You have to read the data sheet. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it is a limited buffer, so that even you have to make sure that what you want to hook up on the output can actually be loaded onto the DAC or at this particular IC. Sometimes it does not have an output buffer, or it's just a weak buffer to just deal with a little bit of pulling, but not too much. Yes? The output of this DAC is monolithic. Yes. Well, think about it with using this one here, right? We have a certain amount of voltages that we can actually select. Switching from here to here will be a jump in voltage, right? So we can't achieve anything between these two frequencies, uh, these two voltages. That's what happens here. It goes from this voltage to this voltage up here. Yes, probably not in a super sharp curve, but there will be higher noise than what you want to do, for example, if you want to generate a sine wave or something like that. So what you have to hook up to on the output is a low-pass filter that will take away these edges and smooth out the signal. Okay, ADCs. ADCs work similar to DAX, except that you now flip it around, right? You have an analog signal that you want to compare to a certain signal that you have internally to a reference. And then somehow you have to transmit and translate that into a digital number. And there are a couple of different techniques on how to deal with that. So let's try to build a flash ADC. Very similar to the first stack that we did where we have a certain number of voltages that we can select from. In a flash ADC, we have, again, voltages that are our references, right? So we have a reference voltage up here ground at the bottom, or this could be your V ref minus, basically, so your upper bound and lower bound. You have resistors in between that divide this difference in voltage here into different levels. Now what? What would you hook up to here? Last time we basically just output these different voltages. Off you go and you have a DAC, right? You select one of these lines, that's your digital number, and you will output that particular line on the, out, on the analog output. This time we want to do something different. Comparators. comparators, exactly. We have a row of comparators. So how does this work? Well, we have an input voltage here, right? And all these comparators will now compare this input voltage to what their reference level is. So they will have zero, for example, if, it's, if this is smaller than the voltage over here, then one, one, <coughs> and one. So how would we encode this now into a digital number? Do we just have a multiplexer, like in the DAC that we had before, where we just selected one of the lines? Sorry, I hear the decoder. Encoder. Encoder. Yeah? What's key, though? Remember, what, we have a 0, 1, 1, 1. What would that be? What number would you output? 4 to 2 decoder. So it's called a priority encoder. So what we put out here is a priority encoder. The priority encoder will basically just look at the highest one that it can find and encode that into a two-bit number. So to put this into a small little table, if there is a 1 on x3, it will always output 1-1. One, one. It doesn't care of what's down below. There's a 1 in x2, it will be a 1, 0. A 1 on the x1, it will be a 0, 1. And a 1 at x0, it's a 0, 0. This is why, if you, oops. If you notice down here, we have VCC at 0, right? So this will make sure that there's always a 1 in the last bit. Any questions on this? Could you imagine another way of doing a DAC, an ADC, 
I have two more slides with two different architectures. So this one here was resistors and comparators. Could you think of another way? In, you wouldn't really change the architecture, right? Could you think about a way of how to do it with just one comparator? Or as many bits as you want. A multiplexer. Multiplexer. How would that work? You could probably do that. But how, oh, you, you mean you put a multiplexer in here and have only one comparator in here and you switch through different lines? Yeah. Could do it, not very elegant. You can get an analog multiplexer. An analog multiplexer, yeah. How about the following? You have a comparator, you have a current constant, a constant current source, and a capacitor. In addition to that, we have a timer or a counter. So how could that work? Well, <coughs> assume at startup, the capacitor is empty, right? Then when we start the measurement, this capacitor will get start charged. It will compare this voltage over the capacitor to the voltage on the input. And as soon as it becomes bigger than the input voltage, this will become done and our bit counter will stop. So it started, the capacitor got charged, and when it reaches the input voltage, this one will stop and will give us the number or the time it took for this capacitor to charge to the voltage V in. So now you know what the voltage is, right? If you know the current and the capacitor, you can calculate what the voltage is at, after that particular time. There we go. Make sense? Yeah? Yes? Um, what do you mean? V in? V in is the input voltage that you want to measure. Yes. Um, you're, oh, you mean if this voltage here over the capacitor doesn't reach V in? No, this is, this is a voltage you are interested in measuring, right? You have a constant current source, so this will always output a perfectly constant current. Dump it into this capacitor. So the voltage over the capacitor will increase over time, right? Once it reaches V in, then this will switch and it will disable the counter. So, one second. What happens is, over time, T, we have an input voltage up here, V in, right? This is always constant. Oh, always constant? We assume it's constant right now. For the, but the measurement that we want to take, we assume V in is constant, yes. Make sense? It has to change over time, but hopefully it changes slower than the speed you want to measure it. And oftentimes what actually happens is in front of the ADC there is a, a voltage buffer. So you buffer the voltage that actually is on the input, do your measurement, and then you renew the buffer again for your input voltage. Yes? So well, it's a sampling hole. Sampling hole, yeah, that's what it's called. Where you sample a charge capacitor, where you get transistor, capacitor, transistor. You open this transistor, charge the capacitor, close it, open the other one, let it go the other way to this well, you do that however, in, oops. however often you are. Into here. Yes, into there. So you're sampling what you're reading onto a capacitor. Yes. And that gets buffered. Correct. So what's your actual sample rate? Is it there? And now your hopes are? In this particular architecture, yes. Right? Very low voltages can be sampled very quickly because your counter reaches that count fast. If the voltages are higher, it takes longer. So you will have a worst case, you can calculate the worst case um, time that it takes to reach the highest voltage that you'd want to be able to sample and you take that as the maximum sample rate. 
Okay, another way. So this kind of gave you an idea of how you could do an ADC, right? Like you have to have some sort of voltage that you compare to the voltage that you're interested in. What did we just learn before we did ADCs? DAX. So how could we do an ADC where this voltage here is generated by a DAC and compare it to an input voltage? You do a binary search, right? That's what's called a successive approximation ADC or SAR. You see that a lot of times in very in cheaper microcontrollers, they have a SAR ADC in them. Very cheap to make because all you have to do is you have a DAC, you then start searching for it by, you start at the mid voltage, you compare it, oh the voltage is, too, is, is lower than this, so you go down to one quarter VRF, it's now higher, it's now lower, it's higher, it's lower. So you start at the most significant bit and go down to the least significant bit. Yes? So why don't microcontroller companies, if there's a DAC in there, why don't you just have a multiplexer that'll take its output to just some pins so that you have a DAC or an ADC? Most likely is because you then can, yeah, it would be a DAC or an ADC. And most of the time people really want an ADC, not the DAC itself. But yeah, it's a good question. You could have one or the other. It'd probably be cheap. I don't know. Yeah. Have to go and ask TI. It's another bullet point on your, on your spec sheet. Go and ask TI. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a reason of why they don't do it. Anybody, everybody understands this concept? Right, very simple. You now have binary search through using your DAC. You go higher, lower, higher, lower, higher, lower until you are at the number of bits that you want to do or that your DAC actually provides and you find your input voltage. Problem with the SARS is that they're fairly slow, right? Because now you have to have a clock rate and depending on the clock rate, you get a different amount of accuracy. but you need to have a, this clock and actually go and search for your voltage. So it's not the fastest signals, but they're reasonably cheap to make. Okay, let's look a little bit about ADCs and errors, yes? Um, yes. So the other one is also not as fast as the flash ADCs. Flash ADCs are the fastest, more or less the fastest you can do, but they are huge, right? Again, like the DAGs that, that were used a um, lattice of resistors, you now need a lot of different resistors. You also have to make sure that the resistors are actually accurate or else you get what we talk about right now, problems in their linearity and different error sources. So imagine... If you really want to read more about it, and this person probably explains it a lot more, and I have all the next figures from this person's website, go and read the article. It's a really good article on error sources and errors in their explanation in ADCs. We try to measure an analog signal, right? Analog signals are not digital. digital. They don't have steps in them usually. So it's a continuous signal going from zero all the way up, in this case now, to one, which would reference the maximum voltage that we could measure in our ADCs. However, what we get out of our ADC are digital steps, right? We get out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So what happens is that most of the time we want to shift this a little bit left. Because if you look at this one here, all the way up to 1 8th, or just before 1 8th, we think it's a 0. It then at 1 8th switches up, we say it's a 1, and then it's an error, error, error. We are correct again. Error, error, error. So we get up to one least significant bit of error. If we shift this curve left by just half an LSP and we actually switch at the half point <coughs> over here, now we have plus minus one half LSP of error, right? So we reduced our mistake a little bit. So if you go and read a data sheet of an ADC, what you can find is what's called an offset error definition. Oftentimes, this offset tells you how inaccurate or how far away of this optimal case you are. And you have to be careful because sometimes they include the one half LSP shift in this offset error, sometimes they don't. So you have to read a little bit of what's going on in this particular data sheet. Another data source will be the differential nonlinearity or DNL error. What that is, is 
if you assume you have a constant step width that you actually measure. Unfortunately, because, for example, like in the flash ADCs where the resistors have slightly different values, these steps will not always be exactly the same. So DNL is what's called the difference between the optimal step and the actual step size. Most of the times, data sheets will give you the worst case that you will find on your ADC. Make sense? So difference in step size. Another possibility of a problem is a gain error. That's basically the error that you get from looking at the bottom where, it's pro where it might be fully accurate. If you gain and go all the way up, there is an error that can get introduced and increase over time, uh, over the, the span of the voltage. That's what call, what's called a gain error. And the last one that's very typically um, mentioned is the INL error or integral nonlinearity. What that means is it gives you an idea of how nonlinear your ADC is. So how far does it actually deviate from the optimal line over the whole voltage range? Yet again, if you want to find out more and more details about this, go and look at that website. It has a, a, a good explanation of all these different errors and why they are important on your ADCs. All right, any more questions on ADCs and DACs, how they work, or anything like that? No? All right, in that case, let's go over to sensors. Sensors will be your bread and butter for your embedded systems project, most likely. Like you want to measure something, you want to measure something in your environment, you're going to do it, want to do an action on it, and then hopefully also actuate something else. So for example, you want to have a robot that drives around, you want to measure your environment so you don't bump into something, and then drive your motors accordingly. Or you could, for example, measure the temperature inside a room, open a window or close a window depending on the sunlight outside, or if you're too hot or too cold. Something that you, physical phenomena that you measure, something that you actuate and then measure again, that's what sensors and actuators are all about. There's a lot of sensors out there. You can measure pretty much any physical quantity that we have these days, um, ranging from acoustics, chemical sensors. You can have flow or fluid, fluid velocities, um, radiation. You can have Geiger tubes and count and measure radiation itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the biggest problems that you always will face with sensors is that the range that they give out is most likely not what your ADC is able to sample. So you have different techniques that you can deal with that. One of them is you can do voltage division. You can vol do voltage amplification if the signals are too small. Or you can do a voltage shift. For example, if your range is from minus, minus 1.5 to 1.5 volts, you can add plus 1.5 volts to your system and bam, get it into the range of 0 to 3 volts, which is a very typical ADC range that you have in your embedded systems. Voltage division, fairly simple to do. You can just choose two resistors, as we had now a couple of times. You know the maximum input voltage. You take, choose the resistor such that the output voltage will be in the range of your embedded system's ADC capability. What's the danger? Well, if you load this line here, then this resistive divider might not be accurate anymore. You have inaccuracies in the resistors and a couple of other problems that can happen. <coughs> For example, if one of these resistors is getting disconnected or breaks or something like that, then all of a sudden this voltage will be drawn up to V in, and bam, oh, there goes your embedded system's ADC input. You can do voltage amplification. All you EEs probably know how the circuit works by now um, in details, I hope, so I don't want to go into how operational amplifiers work, but I give for those who have not seen operational amplifiers a quick primer. The idea of operational amplifiers is that the voltage between the plus and the minus is essentially zero, especially in this particular configuration. So if the operational amplifier tries to keep this at zero, what will happen is that there has to be a current flowing through this particular resistor now, right? You have an input voltage and you have a current flowing through this resistor because this is essentially zero. So we know IG is equal to V in divided by RG. But this current does not come from this output point here. Where it comes from is from this side here. So IG has to come from here, flow th flows through RF and RG, and so now we can calculate V out as IG times RF plus RG. Since we know IG, we can pop it in here, and we get the formula that V out is 1 plus RF divided by RG 
times V in. Very simple amplification algorithm. Any questions? No? Okay. Another way of measuring sensors is using frequencies. And there are lots of sensors out there that can actually get one kind of quantity and make it into a frequency. So there are sensors that can do current to frequency conversion. There are sensors that can do light to frequency conversion. Or there are sensors that do voltage to frequency conversion. So sometimes you don't even need an ADC. You just pop on an 8537. And there we go. Now all you have to do is actually measure a frequency which can be a lot simpler to do than measuring actual analog signals. Because now all you sample is a frequency. We know how to do that using a timer. You just count how many ticks it takes for each frequency step, and then you have your measurements. Here's an example of one of these sensors. This is in a Freescale MMA736. In this case, we have an analog sensor. So it has a G cell in here. <coughs> It has a whole bunch of different um, control logic and gains and filters and, su and stuff like that. And then on the output, it has an X out, a Y out, and a Z out. So how can we uh, find out on how the sensor translates voltages on these pins to G ratings? Well, we have to go and read the data sheet, right? So in this case, something that we find in the data sheet looks at, like a table like this. It will tell us that the zero G output will be um, 1.6 volt typical, not really interesting to us. Sensitivity, ah, there we go, okay. Sensitivity at 1.5G or 6G. So apparently that you can have this chip in two different modes. One of them it measures up to 1.5G and the other one up to plus minus 6G. And what happens is that the output will be typical 6, 8, 800 millivolts per G. Okay. That's good. So now we know it's 800 millivolts per G, or in the 6G version, it's 206 millivolts per G. How do we know where zero G is? Right? We can measure plus and minus. Like, where is zero? Yes. Is it always at 1.6 volt? It's typical. Yes. So there is a little bit of an error that can happen in there. Right? But that's how you read a data sheet. You find out, okay, 0G is typically 1.65 volt if everything goes okay. It can be a little lower, a little higher. And then 1G, for example, would be at 1.65 plus, depending on in which mode you are, it would be 2.45 volts or it would be at 1.85 volts, depending on if you're in 1.5G mode or not. Here's a different sensor. This is a MEMS accelerator, so it's uh, also measuring X, Y, and Z. However, if you look at this picture, there are no analog outputs. At the same time, there is this serial I.O. bit down here. Right? So this particular chip has actually a digital interface. You don't have to deal with any kind of ADC conversions later on. And all you do is you read it through this serial interface down here. You can get the values out for X, Y, and Z and you're done with it. Here's another sensor. This is a light sensor. In this case, this is a light to frequency sensor. Um, if you go and look at the data sheet, you find something like this, where you have a photodiode array, a current to frequency converter inside, and it outputs you a frequency, plus you get four different pins for different configurations. Going into the data sheet, we find graphs, which will tell us what frequency corresponds to what light intensity. So for example, in this case, you have the different S, S0s and S1 configurations, which will swi switch around this particular curve. And then you can look at the different irradiants and what the frequency will be in your system. So what do we have to be careful about, for example, in this particular system? Look at the range of frequencies that you can get. Right? Depending on, first of all, what luminosity you're interested in, as you notice, this is a log scale, so this goes from very almost no light down to like up to like where the sunlight would be. Frequency goes from this is like 0 0.001 hertz. No, this is one hertz down to megahertz, uh, up to megahertz. I'm sorry. So you have to make sure that your system can actually measure these kind of frequencies. 
which is not always easy to do. Okay, we have a lot of other sensors. For example, GPS systems. They don't give you an analog output on a GPS system. But what they do have is a UART interface most of the time. And then there is a standard language that you can talk to these devices, and they will give you out latitude, longitude, and timestamps, and all kinds of interesting um, information about your GPS system. Another more complex trip is this one here. This is an energy metering IC. As you can see now, all of a sudden, these chips start to become fairly complex. Fortunately, data sheets are here to help you. In this case, the data sheet actually gives you all kinds of different configurations that you can use this chip in and help you to design your system the way that they intended you to use their chip. Of course, sometimes that's not what you want to do and then you have to actually invest into some serious engineering. Here's another sensor, a flex sensor. This is a sensor that if you bend it, it will change its resistance. And the data sheet again gives you an instruction on how to use this particular flex sensor. In this case, using it as a resistive divider output with a unique gain buffer at the end. Another sensor is a force sensor. This one here is not when you bend it, but when you actually press on it, it will change its resistance. And again, the data sheet gives you information on what the output will be for what kind of um, input grams and in input forces. This one here is a slightly better circuit. So if you compare this one here, where it's just a resistive divider, you can see the curve looks something like this. If you use it with a gain instead of it, the data sheet gives you a couple of different curves for different values of the resistor RG in here, and then you can select the amount of force that you're interested in. So if you're interested in very small forces, you probably want to go with the blue curve over here because you have higher resolution. If you're interested in higher forces, you go with the green curve over here, which has an almost nice linear relationship from 200 up to um, one kilogram. So depending on what you want to measure, you might have to go and change your circuitry around to keep um, the measurements accurate and in the range of physical data that you want to measure. Any questions on sensors? Okay, then let's talk about actuators. Actuators are things that move something around in the physical world or disconnect or connect something. So for example, we can have solenoids, valves, or cylinders, hydraulic, pneumatics, um, actuators, there are, of course, motors. You can heat something. There's light, sirens, horns. Um, the most significant thing about, uh, about actuators is that they draw a lot of power most of the time. So in order to drive, for example, a motor, you can't just hook it up to your um, analog output pins of an, uh, your microcontrollers because you will just overload your microcontroller. You oftentimes have to have some additional circuitry in order to drive these things. But there are some really cool actuators out there these days. So for example, in this case, this is a, a memory shape alloy. And this little thing, an NM70 uh, actuator, weighs one gram, but it can lift up to 85 grams. So 85 times its own weight. So it's this little thing up here. Using power, you can actuate it, and it can actually lift 85 grams even though it weighs only one gram, it's, a, it's kind of a cool little device. Of course, it does this only because it draws a lot of power to actually lift this thing up there. Linear actuators are also very interesting. So these are devices that can actuate on the span over here. Um, so this is a, a video from SparkFun where they used, I think it's two of these linear actuators, a couple of potentiometers, and by using the potentiometers and turning it around, you can see these linear actuators going left and right. So what they made is basically a physical pong game where the ball is going left and back and forth between the two and using their potentiometers, measuring it, and setting the actuator to the right position. And they say it's either a bounce off or not. So you can see there, they use actually four linear actuators, one up here, here, and then two more, one here, and one over here to move it around. And they made a little pong game. They have another version of this video where they actually hooked up a zapper to themselves. So if you lose, they get zapped themselves. It's kind of fun. Of course, there are other things. And there are uh, servo motors that you use a lot of times in your embedded systems and motors to move something around. Servo motors are very easy to use because all they need is a PWM signal. 
And then the PWM signal has to be a standard. Most typical, it means that the period is 20 milliseconds. And then the T in it for the, the, the width of itself goes from 1 milliseconds to 2 milliseconds. So what that means is that the zero position is at 1.5 millisecond pulses. If you have a 2 millisecond pulse, it will mean all the way to the right. Or if you have a 1 millisecond pulse, it means all the way to the left. That's a very typical interface, but sometimes you have to go and read the data sheet on your um, servo motors because there are other types of interfaces that you can have for them. There's also three different standards for the wiring, so be careful, depending on what type of servo you have, the, the wiring might be slightly different with power, ground, and signal. Any questions on servo motors? Yes? Um, yeah, they are kind of abominations. <laughs> so usually what happens is a servo motor only goes from a certain degree to a certain degree and back and forth. And yes, there are certain servos where they use the same interface and then they change the speed with which they turn in one direction or the other direction, but they are continuous. So they work very similar. There, you just give them a signal of two milliseconds means go as fast as you can in one direction or slow it down or go the other direction faster and slower. So nobody has a question on how servo motors work? How they actually measure their position? Yeah? Is it possible to change the rate of rotation? Not in these particular servo motors that I'm talking about, no. Servo motors is a motor that will, you tell it an angle and it will go to that angle. Right? Yes? Well, yeah, it's just an angle. How does it know to which angle to go? It has a control circuit train side. So most of the time, a servo has actually a potentiometer measuring the position of the server, servo, and then it uses a feedback loop and tries to get to that particular position. Yeah? Good. Brushed motors. <coughs> Who has played around with brushed motors before? Whole lot. Okay. Brushed motors, you can actually also steer them around. So Oftentimes, when you, what the, one of the most fun things to do is take a brush motor, hook it up to a power supply, and you change the voltage, right? And then it goes faster or slower, and then at some point, if you go too far, um, it blows the motor out. A w better way of doing it is actually um, using an H bridge. Because with an H bridge, you always keep this power or the, current, the voltage at the same level, and all you change is you, you pulse it current into the motor. And then on average, that will define the speed that you're running. In addition to that, with an H-bridge, you can break the motor and you can go left or right, depending on what the H-bridge configuration of the different switches are. Oh, that's right. Pro of um, brush motors, they're very simple and cheap. Only two wires. Right? Brush motor has only two wires. Power ground, or you can invert it around and it will go the other direction. Problems, um, not very efficient, need periodic maintenance, and they're noisy. Yes? Does it have a lot less torque than a servo motor? Depends on how much power you give it. There's a brush motor and a servo. Always? Probably. Cheap, Cheap ones, ones, yes. Sorry? Yeah. The problem with them is that they're extremely noisy. If you use brushed motors in your embedded systems, you have to really be careful and filter um, the signals out. Because else these noises that will be generated because of the arcing that can happen in between them um, will feed back into your power supply and in your microcontroller, and that can be very problematic. So you have to have a decent amount of filtering for them. Brushless motors don't have brushes. So brushes are the things up here that touch to either the North Pole and the South Pole, and then when they flip around, they turn and turn, but they are actually touching each other. That's where the maintenance comes from. They are actually um, getting used, and over time, the brushes themselves break, and you have to replace them. Brushless motors work using um, electromagnetics, so there you actually change the electromagnets all the time. Using three different ones, you actually inject a North-South pattern into it, and get another magnet inside of it turning according to your pattern. 
a lot more complicated because now all of a sudden you have at least three wires that you have to actually clock, right? They cost more because there's a lot more wiring inside of them and they have to be more precise. At the same time, you now can get position sensing out of the devices because you know where the magnet is depending on what your pattern is and what you actually sense inside of it. Um, there's no brushes, so there's nothing that's actually touching or um, needing maintenance that way. They can go to higher speeds and they have less noise injected back into your system. At the same time, you need a device that's controlling your um, brushless motor. Oftentimes, you can buy them as small little devices. They're called ESCs. So it, that's an electronic speed controller. An ESC is basically a device that takes in a nice, easy to use signal from your microcontroller and generates the right output signals for your brushless motors over here. In addition to that, many ESCs actually also include Hall effect sensors that can then measure the position of your um, stepper motor, uh, not stepper motor, of your um, brushless motor, and that way you get feedback into your system. You can check that the power you're actually putting into them is really the power that the thing is actually driving at, not a motor that's stalled out or something that hits uh, one of these devices. Any questions to motors? Or brushless versus brush motors? Okay, stepper motors, yet another little thing. Um, these are motors that you can step in a certain degree in increments. They're used everywhere where you need accurate stepping. So for example, 3D printers, the cheap ones that don't have feedback, all they use is a stepper motor to actually step through and go to the right position in, on your um, printer head so you can actually print something out. Same for um, pretty much any printer out there uses stepper motors um, to either feed the paper through or also move the carriage around and then they have a feedback loop to make sure that everything is accurate. 